Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Coker-Hook, and I appreciate your being with us this evening. Tonight, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Arnaud Delhomme, who's with the, Noe the, the Institute of Noetic Sciences up in the uh, uh, Santa Rosa area. So this is going to be a very interesting conversation regarding what it is that the noetic sciences are and how they relate to today's um, perspectives on what I guess we'll call reality. Dr. Delorme, welcome. Thank you for joining us here on Reference Point. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Oh, no problem. And it's great that our Skype connections are working this month. So I'm really happy that we were able to, to, to get together here. So, you know, I was, um, you know, I did a little brief introduction here, but I thought it might be interesting to tell folks a little bit about your background because I was reading some of the bio on you, and you've done a lot of research in the area of electroencephalographic signal recording and interpretation and stuff like that. And it would be great to, if you could give us a little bit of that background and tell us how that relates to the work you're doing doing right now at the Institute? Yeah, so, uh, so that's brainwave research. So I did a lot of brainwave research and I'm actually known uh, for having developed the software that's the most used software worldwide to process brainwave. And so, you know, basically they gave me tenure at university and then I decided, okay, now I can start to get interested, you know, in the research that really matters, the research that can make a difference. And for me, that's uh, frontier research, frontier consciousness. What is consciousness, relationship between the mind and the body? Can we study these questions, etc.? So that's, that's my interaction with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and that's how I became interested in, into these topics. Got it. So, so your, the work that you did in brainwave research was able to, to lead you in this direction? Uh, how, uh, you know, I'm familiar with the concept of uh, EEG. They put the, the stuff on and they check to see whether or not your brain's working and stuff like that. But it's more than that, isn't it? Isn't, isn't there a deeper possible uh, information that you can get from, from those reads, readouts and things? Yeah, in, uh, in clinical settings, they'll check, you know, whether you're conscious or not, you know, in anesthesia or uh, they'll check basic things. When we do that in research, we do what's called cognitive tasks. So we ask people to do complex tasks like memorization and uh, all these kind of uh, laboratory tasks. Mm -hmm. And in my own research, so when I'm doing conventional research, and that's not what I do at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, it's more non-conventional at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, but when I do conventional research, I am most interested into uh, a process that's called mind wandering. It's like when your mind starts wandering, mm -hmm. like when you you know you're reading a book and then your mind starts to wander off. So I'm interested into what mechanism in the brain happens when you just lose track and why do you come back? For me, it's it's at the core of a, you know con human consciousness as well like you know even if you want to stay concentrated you can't your just brain just goes off it just goes you know, where it wants to go right yeah uh, we sometimes think that that's uh, something an organ that you can control that the mind is something you can totally control and i don't yeah. know <laughs> and that's very interesting because expert meditators you know who like train 10 hours a day like for months in retreats uh -huh. they, they realize it's impossible. You can't do that. You can't do it. Even though you think you can do it, you can do it for one minute. You can do it for two minutes, but you know, more than two minutes, nobody. I mean, you know, maybe expert meditators they can they can hold it longer, but nobody can really control that. So that's more my conventional line of research, university based. So let's move over to the work that you're doing at the institute. And before we dig into that, it might be might be helpful for the, the viewing audience and, and to give me a little bit more understanding also is to get a sense of what the noetic sciences really are and what exactly the Institute does. Yeah, so the Institute was created in 1976 by Edgar Mitchell. He had, he's like one of the few astronauts that walked on the moon. Right. Then he had this experience, spiritual experience on the moon as he saw the Earth rise on the moon, surface of the moon, and then when he came back to Earth, he created this institute to study the interface of spirituality and and uh, and science. Okay. Basically. So that's how the institute was was created. 
What was the second part of your question? Well, what what what, what would constitute noetic sciences? Is it is it one particular um, body of activity, or, or are there you know when we talk about science in the conventional sense, there's physics and chemistry and biology, etc., and they're all considered sciences. So, are the noetic sciences a a group of different um, topics, or is it a a focused topic? Yeah, it's pretty focused. I mean, it's the interface, you know, between consciousness, reality, spirituality, and science, basically. Okay. So, you know, we don't make necessarily the assumption, well, consciousness is outside the brain, or, you know, it's like we say, well, you know, it's worth testing using whatever tools we have in science. So that's, that's, that's the interest, you know, neuroidic sciences is basically consciousness, you know, science, but not restricted to the mainstream view that, you know, consciousness is necessarily, necessarily in the brain and... Well, that's an actually something that I wanted to have us uh, discuss in a little bit more detail too, because most people, I think, think of the idea of consciousness as I'm awake versus I'm not awake or I'm coherent versus I'm not coherent. But it's more than that, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's more than that. And I think most people, you know, when and especially in California, you know, when most people have had some meditation experience, mm -hmm. when you start meditating, you know, you saw all your mind chatter and you can't stop it. And you're like, oh, my, I can't stop my mind chatter. And then you realize, you know, there is more than the mind chatter. When the chatter stops, you're still there. Mm -hmm. And so that's more the core, you know, of consciousness, this feelings of being there now. Uh, and yeah, so I think that's, you know, the basic definition you gave is like the standard one and then I think as people you know go into for instance meditation they realize there is more to consciousness than just being awake right there is also like just being here now and so let's talk a little bit about the particular kind of research that you're doing here at, at the Institute that affects this uh, questions of consciousness and reality Yes, yeah, so I'm doing two two types of research. Uh, the first one it's it's centered on the mediumship. So mediumship is like when you go see a medium and you know he tries to read your relatives. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is centered on uh, precognition, like trying to feel events before they actually happen. Mm -hmm. So I can describe the first one a little bit, and then we'll see if we have enough time for the second one. <laughs> And uh, so in the first one, uh, basically the reason I was interested in, in, in mediumship research, like, you know, when you go to see a medium, you say, I want a reading about my deceased grandfather, and then the medium right. starts, okay, now I'm channeling that person. And, um, and the reason I became interested in that is that it's very easy to test from a scientific perspective. You know, the, for either the medium is telling the truth or is not, ah. and so we try. So we try to see. Well, does the medium has any intuition that goes beyond you know chance level? And you know, we don't make any assumption. Well, if if they do have intuition above chance level, like meaning they just don't you know give random information, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean necessarily you know consciousness survives death. It might mean they have it like, you know, they can grab some information in some kind of telepathic way with the person who is sitting in front of them. So there's right. many other explanations. Right. In any case, it is, you know, it is a non-standard type of transfer and that's not currently accepted by science. So in both cases, that's interesting. How do you identify that? What is it about the work that you've done with brainwave research that correlates to this to be able to determine that the, um, what the medium is doing is, is some sort of transference of, of information as opposed to just sort of a guess? Yeah, so we're doing uh, what's called double blind studies so double blind studies, it's pretty much the same when you know you would do in, in pharmaceutical industry. Basically, we have a medium come and uh, we'll give them a list of questions about a deceased person they've never seen and 
ourselves, we've never seen the deceased person or the person that wants the reading, and then we, they would answer all the questions, and then we would ask the person who knows the deceased person to rate the accuracy of the answer, and then that's so that's how we do it in a double blind fashion in the sense that uh, the person who's doing the rating doesn't even know if the reading was for them or not. Got it's it. a pretty complex protocol, but uh, it's it's fully double blind. And then this way we're able to assess, is the medium any better than chance? Or are, just, are we just making random guesses right. and, you know, for instance, you know, yeah. So and, and what have you been able to determine thus far? So we've had uh, two experiments with medium. On the first one, we had six uh, medium. They came from all over the United States. We selected uh, them because they were kind of the best. They were selected by a colleague in the uh, in uh, in Arizona that spe specifically works on on uh, testing mediums. And so we so we had six of them come to our lab and we recorded our brain, their brain waves mm -hmm. and uh, two of them perform extremely well and two others performed okay and two didn't per, didn't seem to perform above chance level so that's what we found in terms of their answers now what we found also is that when they were channeling in their brain waves so when they were communicating with the spirits this was different than when they were imagining somebody oh. because a lot of people will say well you know the mediums they're just very interesting that's yeah, and cool. These, and these results were actually published uh, because we try to publish not in obscure journal. We try to publish in the same journal as other scientists publish, like in what we call mainstream journals. Uh -huh. And this one, uh, so this one was published in a journal that's called Frontiers in Psychology. And it was ranked as the 2% of the most article viewed on um, oh, wow. that journal. So even for, <laughs> you know, and it's purely an uh, audience of scientists. Right. And uh, even for scientists, they're very interested in this topic, even though they don't want to mention it. Yeah, I, I, can, I appreciate that. Well, I want to... I want uh, I want to ask uh, and have you start to, to tell us a little bit about the other topic you mentioned. But before we do, um, one of the things that I remember reading of, uh, as I was looking over information on the website for the Noetic Sciences, it, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, is you know part of the mission is to explore the questions about the makeup of the universe and you know to what to, uh, I think the way the statement goes. Um, Explore the questions about the makeup of our universe, and to what degree, if any, so and and uh, to what degree the research has been able to um, uh, things that have been able to be more broadly employed out there in the scientific community or or the community in general. Do we have any any things that uh, the institute's been around a long time? What are some of the specific successes that have been able to go into mainstream? Uh, so that has been, for instance, uh, if you consider like meditation research, you know, meditation research was not like, if you look like 15 years ago, there was nothing in meditation research. It was, you know, you have to go back to 1970s and then you had a few researchers that went to India with their brainwave uh, apparatus, but then, you know, for more than 20 years, nothing happened and uh, so the institute was pioneer in bringing these topics uh, into into the mainstream and right now it's mainstream there is like federal grants supporting meditation research mm -hmm. and uh, you know so is uh, that is that in terms of what is um, happening as far as brain activity and conscious awareness and that sort of thing in a meditative state is, is that what you mean by the research or yeah, that's what I mean more by, you know, like researching this frontiers topic, like even from the very beginning, like uh, um, Edgar Mitchell was emphasizing, you know, the importance of, you know, meditation and all of these mental states. And, uh, and this was completely ignored by in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So, but we believe like the Institute was giving small grants and there have been research that has been done over the past uh, 30 years at the Institute which uh, I believe, you know, have influenced the mainstream 
in in that way. And then we also have, um, you know, so so there is like uh, it's all the mental states research. So we're advocating, you know, you you have to study these more from a first person perspective, mm-hmm. and you know, like try to understand what's happening in people's uh, people's mind and try to you know study that in a scientific way. And right now it's well on the way. And then the other uh, focus of the institute has been all the the work in in what we call psy research, oh, okay. or some people call parapsychology. And there as well, there has been some some uh, some improvements over uh, over uh, what was done before. And there's still a lot of work to be done. And I mean, I believe in the process of science. So you know, if you have the data. And the data is robust. Eventually, you know, like even the skeptical scientist will will come to accept it. Right. Well, I think this makes it's interesting to me, especially what you just mentioned in terms of the the parasciences, which I believe was the other topic that you said that you were uh, putting some attention on, because there's been a lot of conversation discussion. Uh, military research into some of this stuff over the decades and that sort of thing because people have had cognitive experiences, precognitive experiences or whatever and at the same time there's no um, definitive um, uh, something that you can look at and say this is what's happening and this is what's going on in the brain etc etc so I'm interested to kind of make that transition now into your precog research because uh, that's more of the para uh, psychology concept as well, and and what your uh, and activities, your research, and, and your projects have uh, uh, uncovered in that area. Yeah, well, I mean, the medium the medium study I run, you know, we're also in the realm of psi research, but so and also, you know, you mentioned the military actually. Uh, one scientist at the institute, and there was one that was there before, but uh, she's not there anymore, have been involved with the research that the military uh, was doing. They were the one Mm -hmm. who actually did the research on their contract for the military. So so in terms of the precognition, so there is uh, about two years ago, uh, a paper made the uh, New York Times uh, was in the New York Times describing this professor at Cornell University that showed that you know when you present some images, people are able to uh, to get a sense of uh, of what's in the image before even it appears. Mm-hmm. And um, so the way the experiment ran is that you show some images and then you have to press, okay, I think this image is positive, I think this image is negative, and so you just press a button with your finger. And just after you press the button, there is like a, a cue that appears. And then it either say, okay, nice or ugly, for instance. Okay. And it's either congruent with the picture, like, it, you know, it's like if you have a nice picture, you press the button and then you have the word nice, then it's congruent, or if it's ugly, it's incongruent with the picture. Mm-hmm. And what he showed is that on the 100 uh, subjects or participants, is that when you have congruent, like nice picture and, and nice word, or ugly picture, ugly word, the people are faster at pressing the button than when it's incongruent, like nice picture, ugly word, etc. Well, that's interesting. So that was like, you know that made the New York Times, and uh, it was also uh, in the Cobbler Show. It was in many shows on TV, etc. But uh, we were interested at the institute to try to reproduce these results, so mm-hmm. we decided to collaborate with him. And instead of running 100 subjects, uh, we're running 640 uh, oh, wow. subjects. And we're also interested in testing because we can't run all the 640. uh, participants ourselves Uh so we we kind of hire what we call uh, experimenters to run this the study and we want to see does the experimenter belief influence the outcome because there's a lot of debate if you look at the literature on sci research you have people who do the experiment it works for them you have other people who do the experiment doesn't work for them 
And the people for which it works believe it's possible. The people for which it doesn't work believe it's not possible. Uh, okay, <laughs> self-fulfilling prophecies. <laughs> yeah, and so that's why in this specific experiment, we are going to hire uh, experimenters and they're going to run 20 people each. So we have 32 experimenters times 20 people, about 640 participants. And then we'll be able to say, oh, okay, does it work better when the experimenter believe it's possible than when they don't believe it's possible? So, so that's what we're doing in the realm of precognition, and we're doing that with this professor that's called Daryl Bem. And uh, the experiment, the idea of doing this experiment was uh, Marlene Schlitz and I assist her in, in designing and conducting the experiment. Very interesting. That should be, I'd be interested in what the results are in that one, because it, it, uh, it, it would be interesting to, to do, have that determination as to whether the perspective of the person administering the test has an impact. If that can be eliminated as a variable, then, then that would be a good thing, I would guess. Yeah. So uh, that, we've got maybe you know six or seven minutes left here in our show. One of the things I, I mentioned to you it w that was uh, a question I had that I want to have us talk about for a few moments you know, there's. Um, it seems to me that what what the research that's being done at the institute is really uh, trying to reconcile the the differences between what uh, Western um, science and physics, etc., has talked about. Here's what, what, who we are, what we're doing, how the makeup of the universe, etc., and what the uh, some of the Eastern philosophies have. Uh, looked at for a long time, and so right now we've got this, these um, uh, main. Well, I don't know if I call it mainstream, but the, the the physics activity going on in CERN with the Large Hadron Collider. They're trying to figure out what makes the universe tick, and it's it, and it seems. I'm I'm curious to get your perspective on this because it seems to me that there is a. Uh, uh, a true overlap here between where we're going with the physical sciences and, and physics and what they're beginning to learn about how things go and how things are and what has been uncovered or shall we say rediscovered through the research that you guys are doing as far as the, the human condition and what we as in the individuals can accomplish. So. Is, uh, am I reading more into this than is really there, or is there some sort of? No, overlap? there is definitely something. I mean, the, I'm working uh, a lot with uh, Dean Radin. So Dean Radin is the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and he has this line of research that focuses on can you possibly influence physical phenomena, you know, with your mind. So he's working. On experiments like smaller scale than the CERN, you know, because we don't have the same, <laughs> right? <laughs> agenda, you know, right. It all depends on donations, and uh, and so, but you know, it's still like experiments like that demonstrated uh, the nature, you know, of quantum mechanics, and you know, it's like the double state experiments, for instance, is light a wave or is it matter, or you know, is it a photon, like a particle, mm -hmm. and depending on Actually, the observer, depending on the observer, uh, the light will change behavior. So it's usually through, you know, if you look with a microscope, not a microscope, but, you know, like a measuring uh, device, uh, if you measure light, it tends to behave more like a particle, and if you don't measure it, it tends to behave more like a wave. Oh, really? And that's Yeah, that's how it demonstrated nature of light. And so we're pushing that idea further it's like, well, can you just, without the apparatus, can you just like imagine you're observing the light and does it tend to behave more like uh, like a wave or more like a, a particle? And so that's that's the line of research he's been pursuing and he's been pretty successful at it. And, you know, uh, we've had data from uh, more than a thousand subjects. We run experiments online to gather a lot of data and the results are very promising and were published in, in mainstream journal like Physics SA. Wow. So so we're we're now there it's been reproduced. There is a German group that's trying to reproduce the results mm -hmm. we've obtained, but that's definitely uh, an interest. 
at the CERN, you really the consciousness is not in the picture. Right. Even though like the pioneer, you know, of quantum mechanic, like, uh, you know, they were they were consciousness was an integral part of the. You know, they were saying, well, you know, it's like the collapse. Right. Basically, the you know the quantum effect happens when the the person actually is looking at the measurement device that's looking at the photon. It doesn't happen if only the measurement device uh, is there. So, so there, there's been some evolution right now. Uh, physicists are, you know, they have this uh, this philosophy that's like, well, quantum mechanics is so weird. Uh, it's, you know, the there was a conference in the 1930s that just said, well, shut up and calculate. That's it. <laughs> that's, and and that's, that's still there right now. Like, there is no interpretation of what it means, etc. Because, the you know, it's like, maybe it is beyond what we can understand. Maybe it's right not to want to interpret. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's not intuitive at all. And they decided, okay, you know, it's like, we're just gonna look. We're just gonna shut up and calculate. And consciousness is completely outside. And forget, of the about, forget this. about the consciousness part of it. But it sounds yeah. like what you folks there at the institute are doing actually complements some of the particle physics activity. We're actually run out of time here, so I'm gonna have to say that we need to wrap up. I really appreciate your being here. I do want to say one thing to the folks I neglected to say earlier, and that is, if you have any questions for the doctor or about what we're talking about here for the institute. Send us an email at info at referencepointtv.com and I'll make sure Dr. Nudemont get, gets that information and maybe we can get your questions answered. This has been a fascinating conversation, Doctor. I really appreciate your setting this time aside to do it. And um, maybe we'll get a chance to do a follow-up in the near future on the results of some of your, other, your current experimentation. So thank you for joining us here. And ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your coming and we'll see you next time on Reference Point. Thank you.